If you have your Bible, I want you to join with me in the Gospel of John. We are continuing in the series that uh, you may have thought was finished last week because it was Resurrection Sunday. Uh, we've been in this series called Tetelestai. It's the, uh, the word, it is finished. And what we're doing is um, we're, we're taking the time, one, because I'm a bit of a completionist, I want to make sure that we have the opportunity, because we're, we're a chapter and a half away from just finishing John, so, so why not? And plus, these are the accounts that John is recording for us of the resurrected Jesus, that he is in fact alive. So I think it's fitting for us to kind of continue and finish out this story. So for uh, for today, we're, we'll be looking at John chapter 20, verse 19, and then um, uh, we will take a little bit of a break next week. Uh, we're going to have just kind of a, just a, a special Sunday that you guys have been seeing. It's, it's been promoted. It's called uh, Set Free Sunday. And the, the design behind it is for us to have an opportunity to look specifically at a passage out of the book of Romans. And, but it's something that we're wanting for you to invite people in. Take those cards that you see around, invite people to next week. It's an opportunity to let them know that we have this special Sunday, but also that we're going to be having a fellowship, a barbecue afterwards, and we want them to be here. And if food helps draw them in, so be it, uh, because we want them to hear the gospel of Jesus. And that's what's going to specifically take place next week is an opportunity for people to call upon the name of the Lord to be saved. And so we want to emphasize that. So by all means, next week, plan on bringing someone with you, a neighbor, a friend, uh, a family member, bring them with you if you need to pick them up, but get them here, uh, lure them with barbecue, and then hopefully they run smack into Jesus and he changes their life forever and forever. And so John chapter 20, verse 19, uh, it says here, so when it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and when the doors were shut where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in their midst and said to them, peace be with you. And when he had said this, he showed them both his hands and his side. And the disciples then rejoiced when they saw the Lord. I was asking myself this question over the course of this week. It may be a question that you've even asked yourself from time to time. And it's just two simple words. It's now what? Now what? Or what do I do now that dot, dot, dot has been accomplished or has been taken care of. In the fall of 2013, actually it was in August of 2013, I was told that if I would enter a race, they would give me money. And so I was like, okay, I'll do it. And what it was is it was actually called a mud run. And I'd never done a mud run before, but it's exactly what it sounds like. You run through the mud. And uh, if if I did this, if I entered it, they were going to give me money for adoption expenses expenses at the time. And I was like, okay, good motivation. I'm going to enter into this mud run. But the problem is it's in October. I'm discovering this in August. I have two months to get ready, and I was horribly out of shape, and I was very nervous, and so I realized I not only have the purpose of wanting to get the money, I also now have a new purpose. I don't want to be dead last because I ran in high school, and I I, I saw that guy, and if this was you, I'm sorry, but I saw that guy when you were running in track, and he's been lapped like 10 times, and he's coming at the end, and he gets the standing ovation for finishing. I'm like, no, you should boo that man and tell him you got got last. And so what I found was I was like, I don't want to get last. I don't want to be last place. And so I prepare and I train. I do everything that I possibly can. Good news. Didn't get last. Good news. Got the money. But then as I stood back, I was like, now what? Now what? I I would like to say that I continue to vigorously just work out and take care of myself, but uh, that, that didn't happen. I would also like to say that the adoption thing worked out. That, that didn't happen. And so that question became more common for me over the years of now what? It might even be something for you right now if you're in college or if you're a young adult or if you're an empty nester or whatever stage of life that you are in, it doesn't matter. We continue to ask ourselves the question, no matter what our age, of now what? What am I supposed to be doing now? Well, what, what's, what's my purpose? And oftentimes we have those three kind of major categories of family, health, and career. If I could really emphasize and just see these areas of my life succeed, then I'll feel like I've accomplished something. Uh, For family, it's I have an idea of I'm going to get married by this point, and I'm going to have children by this point. I'm going to have grandchildren, and I'm going to have a retirement, and I'm going to have an inheritance to pass on to my kids, and so on and so forth. We have this idealized idea of that's what I'm going to accomplish. But my question is, so you get married, you have the kids, you get the inheritance, now what? 
or it might be health. I trained for a mud run. You might want to train for a 5K. You run that 5K, now what? You did it, now what? I'll do a 10K, congratulations, you did a 10K, now what? I'll do a marathon, you're crazy, but now what? You do the marathon and it's just like, okay, I accomplished this, but I continue to take steps and I realize there's always a little bit more and one thing that a pastor said to me years ago that I think is just gold is he said, the flesh is never satisfied. The flesh always wants more. We continue to strive for more and more and more to be fulfilled. What about career or in, in, for, for me, for ministry? I remember just a few years back, probably about 2017 or so, I was talking with a good friend of mine. We were both interested in the church planting world of wanting to start a new ministry, a new church. And he had begun a new church within the life of his home. And we were really just, just hashing out what he was experiencing. And he said, Stephen, what I don't want to do is, is he said, we need to have goals. Goals are good. But we need to have these goals of like, yes, I would like to be able to see us get out of our home and into a facility. I'd like to see us be able to grow in some kind of attendance so that we can become more self-sufficient. I'd like to see our budget get to this point. And I'd like to see us maybe get some staff members. And and as we kind of continue to go down that list of some things that are fun to think about and to, to even dream about or have goals for, is he said, what if I get that point? And, and where his mind went was, what if I get to that point of where I'm able to have all, my, my dream team of staff members, and I, and I have about, about 12 staff members that are occupying the executive position and senior pastor position and student pastor and children's minister, and, and on and on and on he went, and he said, and I'm able to make sure that, that because the Lord is being good and our people are, are, are being generous, they're able to be provided for and taken care of financially, they're able to have insurance, all these different things, and he goes down this list, and he says, let's say I reach that mark, now what? The same can be true for us if we're not careful. Is our biggest goal to get out of this facility? Even though we just got here. Well, it's one of mine. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I want to be able to have a, a home that's ours. I want to be able to have a home that has the capacity to even grow more. We, we've seen growth. But we can continue to ask that question, now what? And the only way that we're going to begin to answer that question is, Not now what, but who? Who truly satisfies? And this is, I think, the beauty of the Lord. I think the Lord even allows us to experience things that may not even be good for us. Some of it can be good things, but we get a taste of a little bit of satisfaction maybe with that bottle or with that pill or with that person or that relationship or that career or that identity, and we go, now I feel a little bit good, and then it wanes. It goes away. He gives us just enough of a taste to realize it's not going to satisfy but there is someone who will satisfy. His name is Jesus. And so we have to step back and begin to ask ourselves this question. And, and, and I asked myself this question even when I was in that silly mud run. I was just like, what I'm doing is fun. What I'm doing is not bad, but it's incredibly temporary. And I want us to be a people who are about the eternal That doesn't mean that we don't care about the temporary. It doesn't mean that we don't have goals and things that we want to strive for and achieve here in this life. Uh, You you could be as cynical and say, oh, well, you know, marriage isn't going to be in heaven, so should we even really care about marriage? The answer is yes, God says to. (laughs) It's important. Marriage is a beautiful picture of, of, of Christ and his church. But if marriage is just for marriage's sake, then we're missing the point. Marriage is to point people to Jesus, honestly. That's what he designed it for. And so what we come back to is, okay, there are some temporary aspects, say, to marriage or having children or, or being a part of a ministry, but, but how are you seeking to, to see the eternal within those moments of how you can leverage your marriage for eternal opportunities, how you can leverage your friendships for uh, e- eternal discussions and for people's lives and eternity to be forever changed. And I think it's when we come back to goals are good, but what is my purpose What is it that I want to be about? And we have to, I think, look at Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, and go, well, what was he about? Now, there's some things that he was about we can't accomplish. Sorry to break it to you. You can't forgive anybody for their sins, but he can. He has the ability to do so. But yet, there's so much about Jesus that we can look to and say, yeah, I want to model after him. I want to model after his example and and his purpose. And so, look here in verse, uh, verse 21. 
We've, we've just seen that the disciples are in the upper room. They've locked the doors. Uh, they are a, a bit terrified. In fact, it's interesting. They experienced two incredible emotions. Before we jump to 21, I, I just got to tell you this because I think it's good. Before we jump to 21, in verse 19, it says that they are fearful. The emotion that they are experiencing is fear. Some people wonder, did they already have an idea that Jesus had risen from the dead? My answer would be absolutely not because they are terrified in this moment. They've locked the door. And in a locked door scenario, Jesus shows up. The resurrected bodily Jesus is there in the room with them. And when he shows himself to them, he he shows the, the, the hands and his side They go from fear to rejoicing. It it reminds me of what we saw with Mary Magdalene last week. Remember? Mary Magdalene is there in the garden and she's just grieving and just asking anyone and everyone, where have they laid his body? They've taken his body. They've taken the body of Jesus. They've taken the corpse of Jesus. Where's his body? Give me his body so that I can lay him to rest and I can take care of the, the body. And then Jesus shows up, is actually talking to her. And for a variety of reasons, she doesn't seem to recognize Jesus. She even thinks he's a gardener and says, basically, give me his body. And, and in that moment, Jesus is just, I imagine, is going, you don't want a corpse. You want you want something alive. You want me. And he, she, she finally turns and he, and he says just in one word, even though he's already spoken to her, and just in one word, he just says her name and he says, Mary. And it says she turns around, she, she exclaims, Rabboni, and it says that apparently she just like, just lunges at him. And, and imagine this. I, I can remember I went to Russia for just like two and a half months as a college student, and I came back, and my mom did that thing that you do when you haven't seen someone in a while, and she's like, you're here, you're here. I'm like, stop, mom. And she's just all over, just like, I can't believe you're here, you're home. I, I haven't seen my baby in so long. And here's Mary, imagine this, dead man alive. <laughs> I saw him crucified. I saw him in excruciating pain. I saw him die. And she's just, just clinging to him. And Jesus says, stop, stop clinging to me. And I've heard pastors say this is him kind of getting on to Mary because I'm, I have a resurrected body and if you touch me, it's going to hurt you. I don't think that's it at all. I think what it is is just like, Mary, 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 this is good. This is good. You're, you're clinging to me. You're excited. You're rejoicing. You should be. I'm alive. But, but here's the moment where I don't need you to worship me. I need you to go do this. I have a mission for you. And, and sometimes, have you ever been in a worship setting where it's just been so just vibrant and alive and you're just worshiping and then some 39-year-old pastor gets up and is like, well, it's time for us to go. And you're like, why would you ruin it? It's because we have a mission to go out to and we can still worship on that mission. When she obeys Jesus and goes to the disciples, goes to, as Jesus says, my brothers, she's worshiping Jesus by obeying Jesus. And there she goes, and she tells the disciples, I've seen the Lord. They don't seem to believe her. Obviously, they're locked in a room, terrified. And so here's the disciples, same exact reaction. He's alive, and they're just rejoicing. They're just exuberant and just exhilarated that my friend, not just my master, he was their friend. My, my, my friend is, is alive. And so Jesus, in verse 21 Actually, I, I, I'm, I'm just all over the place today. If, if you're taking notes, and I know Lauren's just like, I, I wrote these and put them on proclaim and I need them in there. Number one is Jesus is faithful to his purpose. Jesus is faithful to his purpose. Okay? So look at verse 21. So Jesus says to them, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. And when he had said this, he breathed and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, their sins have been forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they have been retained. He essentially lets them know you're going to be my sent ones. That's to his disciples, and I believe that's to us today. You are his sent ones. The Father sent Jesus as a missionary into the world to reconcile the world, to redeem the world. And now Jesus is saying, you're going to continue that mission, continue that purpose the purpose of carrying out the gospel. That's our task. That's our purpose, to carry out the gospel. As a married person, as a single person with kids, with no kids, whatever your career may be, whatever your socioeconomic background may be, that's your ultimate purpose. And that is what will satisfy you ultimately is to be obedient to this purpose. This is what Jesus was just driven toward. And so my question to you is if our purpose, and I believe that it is according to scripture, is to carry out the gospel of Jesus, what's been your plan of of attack or strategy? 
Even just two months ago, we had uh, a training for gospel conversations. Have you used it at all? I don't say that in any way to step on toes or guilt or shame. It's not the case. It's not the point. I haven't found anyone who does well and is motivated well for a long-term success by being guilted or shamed into anything. It lasts for just a moment and then it doesn't stick. I'm just asking you, how are you in, in, in proclaiming the gospel and just getting the name of Jesus out of your mouth so that people can hear it in their, in their ears? As, as I've told you before, I, I think a good strategy for us is just to get into just a natural rhythm of where we may not be presenting the gospel, as I say, proper to people, of death, burial, resurrection, here's what you must do to be saved, but it's just talking to people naturally about he who saved you, of just bringing up Jesus. And that can be with someone who is a brother or sister in Christ, or that might be someone who's a neighbor of yours that doesn't know Jesus at all, but you're just naturally bringing up Jesus in the, in the same way that you just naturally bring up the weather because he is just ever present before you. you. You just can't help but talk about him with those who are in your vicinity. But the reality is, is that we get easily, easily distracted even recently, I've had to step back over the last few weeks and just be reminded of, as I've told you before, setting up and doing all this is good. And this is something that we want to do with excellence. But we got to continue to come back to the main purpose of, of why is it set up and why is it being done in such a fashion. We're about to have an opportunity for tomorrow to do Community Coffee Monday. We're going to have an opportunity next week for Set Free Sunday. We're going to have an opportunity in June to do a crossover event where we rent a pavilion in the park at Barfield. And we invite people in and we want to feed them. We want to have a, a cookout and we want to do these things. And events are good, but why are you doing them? so that we can pat ourselves on the back and go look at what we did. We did something. Or we come back again and again to the purpose of hopefully that we can just get into a brief conversation to maybe invite them to church or maybe explain to them the gospel of Jesus. But we're doing this for a purpose and reason. But if not, we could get so distracted of, well, do we have enough grills out there? Do we have enough this out there? Logistics are extremely important for events to take place. But we got to remember that the people are the priority, that they would hear about Jesus, that we would minister to them and that we would love them. And so I, I encourage you, even this week, set up within your schedule an opportunity to just have with intentionality a, a gospel conversation with someone. And intentionally grab one of those cards that are scattered everywhere. If you don't see them, I can't help you. I mean, they are everywhere. Just grab one of those cards and use it as a means just to say, here you go. Be here this Sunday. There's free food. Just, just be here this week at 10 o'clock. And we, we, we have something that we want you to hear. We have something that we want you to be a part of. And, and the purpose is, yeah, you might feel good. That's great. I, I, I don't want you to be stoic, you know, monk person of like, here's a card. No, I want you to be someone who's like, no, here's a card. I want you to come to this. And you do feel good about inviting them. And then that you hope and pray that they do show when you see them walk to the door, you rejoice. And when you don't, you are a little bit down because you care. But let's not get distracted from what the main thing is. And that's the beauty of Jesus. Jesus is faithful to his purpose. He didn't get distracted by anything or by anyone. He stayed steadfast to the journey of the cross and the resurrection so that there could be reconciliation between unholy man and holy God. And aren't we grateful that he remains steadfast? And I believe that there will be individuals who will be grateful that you remain steadfast and that I remain steadfast, that we didn't make it about a show and a presentation. We made it about the person of Jesus and that's what got them into heaven. That's what saved their soul. That's who forgave their sin. It wasn't the event. It was the event in which we were proclaiming the person. That's what we want to do it for. So I go back to what we talked about months ago. Maybe use the question, what's the biggest thing or most important thing going on in your life? Ask that to someone this week. There's, there's a whole litany of things that we can do to, to go forth and to be able to just begin to invite them and to bring them into Jesus. But what I find interesting in this passage that what Jesus does is he's faithful to his purpose by, by sending the faithful. He's gonna send you, he's gonna send me. But if he sends us out, in our own abilities, and we have all of these gospel conversations, and we do all these different events, they'll be completely empty. They'll be good and noble ideas, good and noble intentions, 
but without the person of the Holy Spirit, it, it, it will be empty and weak. Jesus is faithful to his purpose, not just by sending the faithful, but by sending the faithful with power. At times, I think we are hesitant to go forth with our purpose because of fear and because we don't think we have the ability or authority or power to do so. Look at what Jesus does in verses 22 and 23. He says to them, uh, he breathed, and then the next two words are on them, but those aren't actually in the text. It's just simply he breathed and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. Now, these two verses have, have caused quite a bit of uh, confusion, and so I, I want to take just a brief moment to, to try to explain them for us here this morning. In this moment, what I see that Jesus is doing is that Jesus is, is making a pledge, the pledge of the person of the Holy Spirit. And the reason why I don't believe that at this moment that the Holy Spirit has entered into their life, there's a variety of them, but one, read the book of Acts and then notice that it's not until Acts chapter 2 on the day of Pentecost that they received the Holy Spirit. And you say, but, but, but what about here? It says he breathed and said receive. Again, I think this is a pledge of something that is going to take place later on on the day of Pentecost because of a variety of reasons. The same fear that they experienced in verse 19 where they were locked in the upper room is the same fear that we're going to see in verse 26 when they're again locked in the upper room. And what we find after the day of Pentecost, upon the day of receiving the person and the power and the authority of the Holy Spirit into their life, there's no more fear cowering and paralyzed within an upper room. They're going out into their community and out to Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth because they have power with the person of the Holy Spirit residing within them. And friend, you have that too. You have the Holy Spirit. If you can confess Jesus as Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you have the person and the power of the Holy Spirit. This is a pledge, not just to these in this upper room. I believe the disciples are there. I believe some of the women are there. I believe there are some of the other 70 that are there. But, but he's letting them know, you're my sent ones, and I'm not going to send you with nothing. I'm going to send you with the Holy Spirit. I'm not just saying, figure it out, guys. I'm not just saying, just, yeah, just do your best. I'm going to send you with the person and the power of the Holy Spirit so you can accomplish this purpose that I have set out to initiate, which is carrying out the gospel, that men and women can be saved and forgiven of their sins. And so this is a, this is a pledge that we have. In, in Romans chapter 8, verse 9, it says, if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. If you don't have the spirit of the Lord, then there's, there's something off. He's not someone that we have to hunt for. He's someone that we receive upon confession of faith in Christ. Verse 23 is also a bit confusing for some. I mean, read it. If you forgive the sins of any, their sins have been forgiven them. If you retain any, they have been retained. This is where our Catholic friends are, will, will take this passage and will say, this is the, the passage that gives the authority of Peter was the first pope, and since then, all other popes have had the ability to absolve sin, to be able to say, your sins are forgiven. I'm forgiving your sins. And so the question becomes, can we go around forgiving sins? Can we retain sins? And just the simple answer is no. Mark chapter 2, verse 7, it just simply says, who can forgive sin but God? The answer, no one. That, that's, that's God's job. Our job is to share who the Savior is and how you can be forgiven. God is the one who forgives the sins. However, can we go around saying that your sins are forgiven or saying that your sins are not forgiven? And the answer to that is yes. And we live in a day and time, especially in post-modernity, where we say, who gives you the authority to tell me if my sins are forgiven or not? And the answer is Jesus. <laughs> I mean, think about it. To any man or woman who is conscious of his or her sin and he or she repents toward God, believes in Jesus as Lord and Savior, you can say to that man or to that woman, friend, your sins are forgiven. Or if there's any man or woman who willfully rejects Christ, says, I don't believe in him, I refuse to declare him as Lord, you can look at that person and say, friends, sadly, your sins are not forgiven. Because imagine this, imagine that you go and you carry the gospel to a friend or to the park 
and you share with them the truth of this and they hear what you're having to say, that Jesus came to this earth, he loves you, he died on the cross. You quote John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever, and that's you, believes in him will never perish but have everlasting life. And their heart is softened and they're, they're, they're receptive to the idea of Jesus saving their soul. And, and they say, what must I do to be saved? And you tell them, just talk to God, pray to God and, and, and confess him as Lord, repent of your sin. And they pray just the sweetest, most, sometimes if you've been there, kind of one of those prayers, you're like, I don't know exactly what you're saying, but your heart is in a good place right now. And they get finished. And how many times has this happened to you when you've shared your faith and they prayed to receive Christ and they look up at you and they go, did it happen? They're looking at you with just this, did, did, did it work? It's in a moment like that where if I go, well, um, I don't know. Only God knows the heart. And so when you die, you'll find out. Good luck. And you just go on about your business. Like, it's no. This is Jesus saying, no, no, no. Friend, upon the confession of your faith in Jesus that he is risen from the dead, and the reality that you have repented of your sin and toward towards, turned towards God, by the authority of his word, you are forgiven. I can't forgive you, but according to his word, this is how you're forgiven. And I want you to know that. I want you to experience that. You have the right to say, and with that power and authority that, yeah, to say, yeah, your sins are forgiven if it lines up with the authority of God's word. Otherwise, what power and authority do we have to, to go and share anything if we can't give them the, the understanding that according to the word, this is how you are saved? It, 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 it just, it just, it, it would weaken us. We would be cut out from the knees. We, we wouldn't have any leg to stand on to be able to, to go forth with power and authority. So thankfully, Jesus says, you have the power and authority to do this. I can remember it was kind of a terrifying situation. I was in college and me and a group of friends, we had an eclectic group. We had Christians, we had nominal Christians. Uh, we had um, uh, some, some Jewish friends. We had some Mormons. We had a whole variety. It was just a little, little pot of, of, of people just kind of hanging out together. And we were in, in, in my apartment with my roommates and we were just literally just talking. And as we got into that discussion, as we began to visit with one another, it began to get very, uh, very real and very serious. And one, one of the girls, she just spoke up and she just said, so for the Christians in the room, you're telling me that if I don't confess Jesus as Lord, if I don't believe that he is risen from the dead, if I don't repent of my sin, I'm going to die and spend a Christless eternity in hell. Is that what you're telling me? It got really, really quiet. <laughs> And then she looked right at me and she goes, Stephen? And I looked back at her and what you could do is go, I have the power and the authority to tell you. But instead, I genuinely looked at her with care and concern and I said, sadly, according, not to me, according to the word, yeah, you will spend a Christless eternity in hell. I don't really remember how the conversation turned from that. <laughs> but I do believe that even as a 20 year old in that moment, as a follower of Christ, I have the power and authority, not on my own, but on the basis of his word to be able to say, hopefully with kindness and love and tact. Yeah, that's, that's the reality of the situation. And I don't want to just punch you, but I also don't want to pull punches. I don't, I don't want to soften the reality of eternity. And I don't want to do that for any of you as well. And again, we live in a day and a time of how can you possibly think you can say that? If it wasn't for the word, I don't feel that I could, but because we do have the word, I know that we can. But let's do it with kindness and grace and love. Grace and truth. We need them both. And so Jesus here is incredibly faithful to this purpose, incredibly faithful to the purpose. But what's wrapped up within that purpose is that he's incredibly faithful to people. That's number two. Jesus is faithful to his people. Look at verse 24. We're going to have to go through this section a little bit quicker. Uh, 
but this is our section with Thomas. It says, but Thomas, one of the 12 called Didymus was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples are saying to him, we have seen the Lord. They're, they're excited. But he said to them, unless I see in his hands the imprint of the nails and put my finger into the place of the nails and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. After eight days, his disciples were again inside and Thomas said to them, uh, or, or excuse me, Thomas with them. And Jesus came, the doors having been shut or locked. Again, the Holy Spirit's not there with them yet. And Jesus stood in their midst and said, peace be with you. So, so at this moment, we find that Thomas is not with them. Can I just tell you another reason? Don't miss church. You don't know what you're going to miss. He, he just might show up in a way that's just profound in that moment. And you need to be here. You need to be a part of that. But, but what we find in this, this, this is, I think, just a beautiful, beautiful thing. I've made the comment, Jesus is faithful to his purpose. Jesus is faithful to his people. Jesus is just simply faithful. He's steadfast. Revelation says that he is faithful and true. But, but listen to this, because I think this may be the word that some of you need to hear today. Jesus is faithful to the faithless. Do you hear me? Jesus is faithful to the faithless Thomas. There's going to be, I think, a scripture, 2 Timothy 2. Is that one up here? I want to look at it with you. Is it on there? No, just kidding. Lies. Um, 2 Timothy 2, verse 13. It says, if we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. I'm going to read that again because it's good. Because how many times have you been wandering through this life as a believer in Christ? I'm not talking about someone who's lost. So I believe for a lot of you in this room this morning, I don't want to make assumptions, but a lot of you have confessed Jesus as Lord and you've traveled through this life in this sin-soaked world and it's gotten hard and it's just been beating on you. And you've been looking around just like, God, where are you? What's going on? This is difficult. Are you, are, are you true to me? Are you faithful and true? And what we find is in 2 Timothy chapter 2, this is the last book that Paul writes before he's martyred for his faith. He's in chains. He's imprisoned. And he's telling Timothy, if we are faithless, when we have those moments of struggle and doubt as believers in Christ, he remains faithful for he cannot, cannot deny himself. Some of you need to hear that today. He cannot deny himself. He has to remain true to who he is. So even when your faith runs clear out of gas, God will meet you at the point of where your faith is weak and lift you up again because he cannot deny his own. It reminds me of the man in, I believe, Mark chapter 8, where he, he, Jesus uh, and him were talking, and he said, cries out to Jesus. Jesus asks him, do you believe? And he says, I believe. Help my unbelief. I've had those moments where like, God, I believe, but maybe not in every area, so help my unbelief because I'm struggling. I believe. Help my unbelief, Lord. I, I need you to build my faith up. If I try to build up my faith on my own, it's going to be in my effort and my power, and it's going to crumble. But if you will build my faith up in you, it will have a steadfast foundation. Father, Father, help my unbelief. And so in verse 27, he shows up to Thomas and, and, and I, I, love, I love this fact. He says, reach here with your finger and see my hands and reach here with your hand and put it into my side and do not be unbelieving, but believing. Do you realize that Jesus, he showed up to all of his disciples at the beginning of John chapter 20, verse 19. And the only reason he has come back is for one. He shows up for one. Sometimes we go, does he care about me? <laughs> And we got to be careful about making Christianity all about you because it's not. But the beautiful thing is that Jesus loved Thomas enough to be able to say, I'm coming strictly and only for you. I already showed up to these guys. I'm coming for you. He's not too busy to care about just everyone else but you. He cares about you. Yes, even you. And when he comes in, he doesn't say shame on you, Thomas. He says, peace to you, Thomas. Now, verse 28, Thomas answered and said to him, my Lord and my God, perhaps the greatest confession that you could possibly ever make, my Lord and my God. You see, Jesus wasn't just simply a good teacher. Jesus wasn't just simply the Lord or a master. Jesus was God in the flesh. And he doesn't even say the Lord and the God. He does personalize this. He says, my Lord and, and my God, because it is a personal relationship that you as an individual are entering into, that you would come to a point to recognize that Jesus is the authority because Jesus is God and I choose and submit unto him and his headship of my life, of my death, of my eternity. This is my Lord. This is my God. 
And so, as I've told you, Jesus is faithful to his, his purpose. And that purpose is to carry out the gospel, to see holy God and unholy man to be united with the forgiveness of sins by his work upon the cross and his resurrection from the dead. But wrapped up inside of that whole purpose of Jesus, and part of the purpose of Jesus is the glory of God. Part of the purpose of Jesus was to lead lead and live a sinless life. Part of the purpose of Jesus was the miraculous works that he performed, his sacrifice upon the cross, his victory over death and the grave and sin. But wrapped up also within all of that, within his purpose is people. If we lose sight as a church that yes, it's about the purpose is about the glory of God and carrying out the gospel. But have you been a part? I have, I've been a part of churches where the point of our task is to carry out the gospel. And so we're going to go, we're going to knock on doors and we're just going to hand out a pamphlet and we're just going to move on because you're a number. This is something I'm supposed to do. I'm going to get the check mark on my envelope when I was in Sunday school back in the Southern Baptist church. So I could say I visited someone this week, but had nothing to do with compassion or care for people. I'm I'm almost hesitant to say this because I don't want people to not show up. But when we have an event uh, like Barfield Park, and and it's just routine, which discipline is good, but your heart isn't there for the people and for the purpose, just, just be careful that we don't get down that track of legalism, but that we always have a desire for care and compassion for these people that they would come to know a holy God. And so, at Jesus uh, 29, Jesus said to him, because you have seen me, have you believed? Blessed are they who do not see, yet believed. That really speaks to us. Some 2,000 years later, to not see the nail prints of Jesus or the piercing of his side, that we believe based upon the authority of his word. Jesus says, if that's the case, if that's you today, you are blessed. And so all that to come to this point in verses 30 and 31, this, this is not just the, the big purpose or so what of, of this section, but it's the so what, what's the point of all of this, John, uh, out of his entire gospel, out of everything he's written from John chapter one onward to this point. And, and it's at this point that if you have the ability to take notes, I want you to jot these down because you're not going to have time to, to write them all down. But Look at what John says in verse 30. He says, Therefore, many other signs or miracles Jesus performed in the presence of the disciples, but they are not written in this book because there's just too many. But these specifically have been written. Why? Why did you choose these, John? So that, here's his purpose, so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. That's his purpose. He wants you to believe in Jesus. My purpose, hopefully, in preaching, our purpose as a church, hopefully, is that people, you, others, would believe in Jesus as Lord. And this is the beauty of the Gospel of John. I just want you to jot these down as quick as you can. We're going to go super fast. In John chapter 1, verse 12, the purpose of why John is writing that the word became flesh and dwells among us is because in John chapter one, verse 12, it says, but as many as received him to them, he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name. Write down this one, John chapter two, verse 11. You remember the miracle at the wedding of Cana in Galilee? He turns the water into wine. Why? Because he just wanted to do that. No, this beginning of his signs, Jesus did in Cana of Galilee and manifested his glory and his disciples believed in him. What was the purpose of Nicodemus coming to Jesus in the middle of the night and Jesus sharing these words is why John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Are you picking up a pattern? John chapter four, the woman at the well. What was the purpose of Jesus meeting the woman at the well? John chapter four, verse 42, write it down, go read it later. They were saying to the woman, these are the Samaritans. It's no longer because of what you have said that we believe, For we have heard for ourselves and know that this one, Jesus, is indeed the Savior of the world. What about John chapter 5? Does he talk about believing there? He certainly does. John says the purpose of Jesus declaring himself equal with God the Father is 524. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and does not come into judgment, but is passed out of death into life. John chapter 6, Jesus says, I'm the bread of life. And so saying, truly, truly, I say to you, he who believes has eternal life. In John chapter seven, Jesus declares that he will satisfy your thirst. 
He says in John 7, 38, he who believes in me, as the scripture said, from his innermost being will flow rivers of living water. In John chapter eight, Jesus speaks honestly about sin. We don't often like to do that. But in John 8, 24, he, therefore I said to you that you will die in your sins. There's a seeker sensitive sermon. For unless you believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. John chapter nine, the purpose of healing the blind man so that he could regain his sight. Jesus says to him, do you blind man or former blind man, do you believe in the son of man? And he answered, he said, who is he Lord that I may believe in him? And Jesus said to him, you have both seen him and he is the one talking with you. And he said, Lord, I believed. So he worshiped. The purpose of Jesus performing miracles, miraculous, great works. Jesus explains it in John chapter 10. This is the purpose behind all of that. He says, if I do not do the works of my father, don't believe me. But if I do, though you do not believe me, believe the works. So that you may know and understand that the father is in me and I am the father. Jesus resurrected Lazarus from the dead. Why? What's the purpose? He says in John 11, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even if he dies. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? Mission point. Do you believe this? John chapter 12, Jesus says, I'm the light of the world. Why? Well, John 12, 46, I have come as light into the world so that everyone who believes in me will not remain in darkness. He goes on, John chapter 13, it's the night that he washes the disciples' feet. It's the night that he's going to be betrayed by Judas. The purpose of Jesus being omniscient and knowing all things, John 13, 19. From now on, I am telling you before it comes to pass, so that when it does occur, you may believe that I am. Jesus in John chapter 14 wants to comfort his disciples because he's about to go away. This is the famous section where he says to Thomas uh, and to the disciples, I am the way, the truth, and the life. But before that, he says, do not let your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. John 15, there's no believing in that passage. But John 16, the purpose of the Holy Spirit being sent is to convict us of sin. Why? Because John 16, 9, concerning sin, uh, uh, be convicted of sin because they do not believe in me. John 17, the purpose of that high priestly prayer that we be unified that they may all be one, even as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you sent me. John 19, this is John, the gospel writer, testifying to what he's seen upon the cross, seeing his friend die. In John 19, 35, he says, and he who has seen has testified and his testimony is true. And he knows that he is telling the truth so that, so that, so that you also may believe. And he comes to the very end in John 20, 31. He says, the whole point of why I took the time to write this gospel account, 21 chapters. These have been written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the son of the God, and that believing you may have life in him. You say, well, that's interesting, pastor. Why did you bring that up? What was Jesus' purpose became John's purpose. And what's been John's purpose and what he was willing to go through excruciating torture and pain and exile for that people would believe in Jesus is your purpose. Your purpose is not to be your best self. Now your purpose is not to experience comfort and retirement. Your purpose is not to get the ideal job or to get the ideal mate. Your purpose above all else And by using the means of a job and that ideal mate and those resources is so that you can leverage that so that they will believe that's your purpose. And that's our purpose. Prairie scene, would you guys come on up? I just want to say just a couple of things that I found interesting in the old Testament. Only 38 times was the word believe used. In the New Testament, it's used 221 times. And out of those 221, John, in the Gospel of John, uses the word believe 81 different times. The next closest is the book of Acts. And it's double that. It's more than double the amount of times that John uses this word. This is what he's wanting to convey. This is what he's wanting you and me to get. 
And I love the fact that he's so blatant and so clear. He, he's not trying to kind of worm his way into maybe if I say it in a certain way that they'll come to saving faith in Christ. He's just, I, I'm telling you this because I want you to believe in Jesus. I, I think there are people in our lives that they just simply need to hear the truth that Jesus is alive and that Jesus saves and you can introduce them to them. And so in just a moment, what I want to invite you to do for your response as they sing is honestly, for the first little bit, you, may, maybe you sing, but maybe, may, maybe you don't for a little while, because again, this is your chance to, to respond. But I just want you to, for, for just a moment, just to say, Lord, I've seen the faithfulness of Jesus. He, he, just, he just never wavered. Maybe this morning, before you begin to sing, you just utter just the, the quietest prayer from your mouth or from your heart and say, God, I believe help my unbelief. And for others of you, I want to urge you to adopt his purpose for your life and for mission point. We want to see people believe. And so I don't know exactly specifically what that looks like for you. For some of you, it, it might mean that there might be some ideas or things that you need to lay at the altar, <laughs> that you need to lay at the foot of the cross and say, good, but it's distracting me from that eternal purpose. I'm more focused on the temporary. The temporary is good, but I, I don't want to be distracted, Jesus. And so what I want to invite you to do is I want you to stand. And then if you need someone to visit with and you're just saying, Pastor, I'm just struggling with my unbelief in whatever area of life, I'll be right here. I'd love to visit with you. I'd love to pray with you. But as they play, you all respond and just spend some time just, just talking to the Lord and committing yourself and adopting this purpose into your own life. Here's my-